Hello, my dear friends. A very good morning once again. We are back after, a, uh, for by our standards, a big break. Maybe we are coming to you after a break of one month in between. And so this is going to be our 10th chat show in this series of Diginal PGE module. We have had earlier chat shows on neurology, gastroenterology, neonatology, endocrinology, intensive care, cardiology, ECG, x-rays, recent advances in pediatrics and recent guidelines. And now today we have with us uh, Professor Pooja Divan, uh, who is a professor of pediatrics at University College of Medical Sciences and also the associate editor of uh, Indian Pediatrics. Recently, you must have uh, read the guidelines, recently released guidelines by hematology chapter, and she had played a big role in all those guidelines which have been now uh, released. So uh, today the topic will be uh, hematology and uh, Dr. Pooja will take you through uh, with a case-based approach to how to interpret the CVC, the peripheral smear and the normal how to case-based approach to various causes of anemia including nutritional anemia, bone marrow failure syndromes, uh, approach to a bleeding child, uh, platelet uh, disorders, and um, uh, so you have a, a good session in store. Dr. Pooja, welcome. And uh, we can uh, over to you now. And students, uh, as you know, those who have joined earlier, uh, they know. And those who are joining for the first time, feel free to put your question in the chat box. Uh, and whatever your question will be, I'll take up those questions with uh, Dr. Pooja. And uh, she will be answering all those questions. We hope that we have a good session now on. Over to Dr. Pooja. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. And uh, hematology is pretty vast and uh, the time that we have is short to cover all uh, cases. We will try to squeeze in as many cases as possible, provide you with uh, images from the peripheral smear and I hope you will interact and make it more fun. So uh, without much wasting any more time, I'll get on with the um, first case. And for that, I'll be sharing my screen with you people. So is my screen visible to all? Is the screen visible, sir? I think, sir, you're muted. Sir, this, uh, you are muted. Yeah. I think I have already introduced Dr. Pooja Devan to you and learning objective. We straight away go with the case one. Uh, over to Dr. Pooja. Okay, so uh, this is a scenario of a four-year-old boy who has come to you with pallor for three to four months in your OPD. When you inquire the com other complaints, you do not find any history of bleeding. There is no fever, no palpable lump or swelling that they have noticed. Weight loss is not significant. There is no bony swelling, no bony pains, no previous history of jaundice. However, the mother gives a history that the boy has a habit of picking on the wall. That is pica. So he uh, sucks on mud. He eats the wall uh, cement off. So that is pica. There is no history of any previous blood transfusion, chronic drug intake, surgery or chronic illness. When you inquire from the mother, she feels that the child is a fussy eater, he's a vegetarian and predominantly milk-based diet. So with this uh, scenario, which we encounter very commonly, what is your impression? Okay, so we expect your um, answers in the chat box. Uh, I think straight away you got an answer as iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency anemia, iron deficiency, iron... So far, all the answers are in six or seven so far. I think everybody, so okay. there is no doubt, everybody is saying iron deficiency is the anemia. But is it solely iron deficiency anemia or it could be something else? Over yeah. to Dr. Pooja. Here is what is important. So when you are looking at the CBC, you will definitely order one CBC here. I think my slides are not, yeah. So um, you see that the hemoglobin is 7.4, which is low for age, so the child is anemic. The WBC count is normal. If you look at the DLC, that also appears more or less normal for age. The platelet count is 6,53,000. Like 
the RBC count is 3 million. The MCV is 68, MCH is 17.1, and MCHC is 27.4 with an RDW of 27. So um, let's see the normal reference values. So uh, we define anemia as per the WHO classification. This being a four-year-old boy with a hemoglobin of 7.4, he would fall in the moderate anemia category. For MCV, we generally take anything which is less than 80 as suspicious of microcytic anemia. There is a formula, of course, that for two to 10-year-old child, 70 plus the age in years, so that would be 74 for this child to define microcytosis, and he had a value of 68, so that suggests microcytosis. The MCH for this child was again low, and uh, you can see that it was 17.1, uh, and the reference is 29 plus minus 2, so around 30-ish should be okay, and MCHC up to 34, that is 32 to 36 is what we take, so anything around 34 is considered normal. And if you see that this child again has a low MCHC, which indicates that the child has. So any inputs from your side? It's simple, the interpretation. So anyone can just post what you feel is the interpretation of such a CBC. So what kind of anemia the child is having? Obviously, the child is anemic. You have already said. So it has to be in terms of the uh, morphology, the on the peripheral smear, what do you expect on the anemia? So I what see that of... Rad Lakshmi post that it is dimorphic. Yeah, so it is, uh... The rest of you are writing microcytic hypochromic. So yes, it is microcytic hypochromic. And why do you think it is dimorphic? We have not yet seen the peripheral smear. So why are you thinking of a dimorphic anemia? Any reason? I think, Dr. Pooja, it has to be one way only. You have to, uh, because it will not be possible for them to answer to your queries. Okay. So, so just uh, we have their queries and you answer their queries and okay. clarify. So for this, we will need, I would say that first I would like to see the peripheral smear and then say whether it is dimorphic or not. So this is what we see on the peripheral smear. So we see um, some cells, which are the RBCs and you see the lymphocyte also, you see the hypersegmented. Uh, you see the segmented neutrophil here. So what is A that you see? Uh, so, yes, your suggestions on A, expecting the kind of cell. You can see A. Uh, so far, no answers so far. Any, any answer? Central pallor is there. Okay. Hypochromic RBC, hypochromic. So these are the uh, three answers we've got so far. Okay. So this is a small RBC. So it is a microcytic hypochromic RBC that we see. Somebody so is also see. saying target cell. Okay. So this is not a target cell. We'll see that later. Although I can see target cells here as well. But we'll come to target cells again. Uh, what we see here is a microcytic hypochromic RBC. What about B? What is B and what is C? So first B. So we are talking about B. B is a ovelocyte, teardrop cell. These are the two answers. Anisocyte. C is pencil cell. Okay. C is okay. a leptocyte. So these are the few answers okay. that we got till so now. B is an ovelocyte. That's correct. And C is a pencil cell. That's also correct. And any variability in shape is going to be called as an isocyte. So somebody said a teardrop cell. So as you can see my cursor, the cursor is pointing towards a teardrop shaped RBC and the target cell or the codocyte as we also call it is this cell in which you see a center which is a little darker and uh, this is because you find a discrete whenever the RBCs are smaller in size. So there is a uh, the cell membrane is relatively more compared to the cell volume. So what you see in the center of the cell is a degenerated uh, hemoglobin or uh, ineffective hemoglobin synthesis that is actually a target cell or a codocyte. And target yes. cells can also be seen in iron deficiency anemia. But yes, they are also seen in several other conditions and we will be seeing those conditions as well. So, so it is easy to remember a target cell. Remember, there is always a target in, in between. In the center, there is a target. Remember that. If you don't see a target, like here you said, so it was only a hypochromic uh, RBC. Yes. Yeah, please, Dr. Pooja. 
So what could be the causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia? And we all know that the common causes are iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease, rare conditions like A transferemia. Then there can be defects in the globin gene synthesis like thalassemia and other hemoglobinopathies. And even in lead poisoning and sideroblastic anemias, you can have a microcytic hypochromic picture. So again, a little question for you on the smears on the right, in the first smear on the top, what do you see? So can you make a diagnosis if you see, you see there are microcytes and there is a central pallor which is increased. But what, what do you see here? Can you make a diagnosis based on this? Okay, the first answer that comes is, uh, is a sideroblast. Uh, we are waiting. Basophilic stippling, uh, ringed sideroblast, basophil, sideroblastic anemia, basophil stippling. Okay, ma'am has not asked you the diagnosis. Let's, let's not go to the lead toxicity. Just identify what kind of cell is it. So it is basophilic stippling okay. and sideroblast. These are the two common answers given so far. So the answer is basophilic stippling as, and as rightly pointed out by another student that this is commonly seen in lead poisoning. So if you see such kind of a smear, you are going to suspect lead poisoning and investigate accordingly. Now on the smear below again, I want you to identify a few cells which, um, you know, are atypical. So I know the green arrow, you all can tell me now that you have seen in the previous smear. So green arrow is a? This should be a sure shot. Yeah. Yeah, the cell with the green arrow. Yes, you're right on T. <laughs> so, so many target cells coming up straight away. That's Thank you. Cell. Yeah, yes. next. And what about this cell that you see here? The blue arrow, the cell pointed by blue the blue arrow. arrow. You are right. Cell by the green arrow is a target cell. Cell by a blue arrow. NRBC means a normal RBC or a nucleated RBC? Nucleated RBC is uh, that the Dula says. Nucleated RBC. I think all the answers are nucleated RBC. You are fairly good at seeing your peripheral smears and it's very encouraging. It is indeed a nucleated RBC. So how do you distinguish a nucleated RBC from a WBC or a lymphocyte? Why not a lymphocyte? Any point that will differentiate the size, uh, uh, Unmesh says that the size is one. Okay. Then it is multi-lobe. Size is again pointed out as the major factor. Cytoplasm is comparatively pink and similar size. More cytoplasm, Absolutely. less nucleus. Lympho has large nuclei. There's a nuclear rim. So these are the various answers. Okay. So the uh, a nucleated, this is a nucleated RBC. And as you will notice that the size is going to be slightly smaller than a, a WBC, even a small lymphocyte. The, the regularity of a lymphocyte is more compared to a nucleated RBC. And further, the cytoplasm will be quite abundant here and will be a little um, pinkish compared to a, a lymphocyte. Now, uh, we also noticed that with this patient had an increased RDW. So he had an RDW, which was 17%. So whenever you have an increased RDW, you will think of certain causes. The most common that we encounter is nutritional anemias. But RDW can also be increased in thalassemias, in sickle cell anemias, fragmented hemolysis, microangiopathic anemias, even in liver disease and kidney disease. However, some conditions like thalassemia trait, hereditary spherocytosis, anemia of chronic disease, aplastic anemia, which also may have a microcytic hypochromic picture, you would found, find a normal RDW. So coming back to this case. So this case, we notice again few things on this slide. RDW is increased, has already been discussed. Now tell me something about the RBC count is something abnormal here or is everything fine? Is RBC count normal or there is something abnormal in the RBC count? That is 3 million per millimeter cube. Yes, it is low. Uh, everybody is saying it is low. Yes, so it is a low RBC count. Here what you need to remember is there is a broad rule of three that we use. So we say that when you multiply the RBC count by three, approximately the value that you get should be equal to your hemoglobin. And when you multiply the hemoglobin by three, what you get is the PCV. 
So when we multiply by three, we don't get nine. So RBC count is definitely compared to the hemoglobin, it is more. So the rule of three is not being followed. That is one point. So there's something amiss here. Why is the rule of three not being followed? So let's move ahead. This we've already uh, seen that low RBC. Okay. Yeah. Low RBC counts are commonly encountered in iron deficiency anemia, folic acid and B12 deficiency. Apart from that, anything which is suppressing the erythropoiesis, like it could be an aplastic anemia, dyserythropoietic anemia, even in hemolytic anemias, sideroblastic anemia and anemia of chronic disease, you have a low RBC count. In contrast, a thalassemia trait child would be having a higher RBC count. So um, from here, we can say, yes, this will not be a thalassemia trait. Number one, because the RBC count is on the lower side. And number two, because the RDW is raised. But in our situation, often we find that the two things can also overlap. So you need to be very careful when you are interpreting these things and see all the parameters before you make a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. So from this picture, it looks to be an iron deficiency anemia. So will you be performing iron studies? How many of you do iron studies in routine practice? In a child where you are suspecting clinical setting is of iron deficiency and uh, the peripheral smear also suggesting iron deficiency, do you need iron studies? The answer is no, yes, no, yes. Uh, so I think so it's a divided do. house. 50% uh, say no, 50% say yes. So even if you want to do it, most of the times you will not have facilities for the, for the same. The reports will take longer to come. These are costly tests and they may not be always very fruitful because you will end up with the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia in most of the cases. So unless you are having some diagnostic dilemma or you are, the picture is not clearly of an iron deficiency anemia, only then you or the, you find that you've given treatment and the patient is not uh, going the way he should. Only in those situations, we should go ahead with iron study. So in most cases, I would not order an iron study and I would proceed with therapy and assess the response. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Can we go on to the next? Uh, yeah. So uh, these are the common tests that are used for studying the iron uh, status of a child, serum ferritin, and the values for an under 5 child would be less than 12, for an older child less than 15. It is not a good marker in the presence of inflammation, where we would take higher cutoffs of 30. Transferrin saturation is another parameter used commonly and a value less than 16% in older children and less than 12% in younger children would be suggested. The Coulters have something which is called as a reticulocyte hemoglobin content. We'll come, that, come to that later. It is also called as reticulocyte hemoglobin equivalent. And if it is less than 29, again, it suggests a decreased iron. You have percent hypochromic cells, soluble transferrin receptors. These three are not routinely available to us. And if your Coulters are good, you may have the, um, these two values in your Coulter reports. And soluble transferrin receptor is something which is done mostly for research and not for clinical practice. Apart from that, even free erythropoiesis uh, porphyrin is not routinely do done, but TIBC is done in most hospitals. So these parameters are needed only when you are in a diagnostic dilemma. And as you can see from the table here, that based on these parameters, it is simpler to distinguish conditions of iron deficiency anemia Chronic, chronic inflammation, thalassemia, and even sideroblastic anemia. So this is a table which you should remember. And as you can see that even if you have TIBC and ferritin, a lot of these conditions can be easily distinguished. Serum iron is a parameter which is not favored by most people because it is a very labile thing. So you have iron in the morning, your serum iron goes up. So it is a very... Um, Labile kind of a parameter does not reflect the true status of a patient with iron deficiency. So what will you do? So as we said that we will not do iron studies. Instead, we will give a trial of oral iron for three months. Ferrous sulfate, fumarate and gluconate are the common preparations which are used. Others could be ascorbate and IPC, which are costlier. Now, uh, the dose is usually 3 to 6 mg per kg per day, often given as a single dose, 
However, if your child is having severe gastritis or side effects, then you may give it in divided doses. Ideal method would be to take it in a fasting uh, state. However, again, because of gastric side effects, you may want to give it with meals, but the absorption of such an iron can be a problem. <clears throat> in the market, you will come across preparations like entry coated tablet, delayed re release iron supplements. And even uh, these days, you find uh, Tassiron sachets, which are, you know, used like used very commonly in practice. And these are actually liposomal iron uh, formulations, which are known to have lesser gastrointestinal side effects. But these are all very costly. The absorption is not sure shot. So we do not recommend their routine use. It is not right to ask the parent to buy such costly medications. Instead, it is better to give your iron in divided doses to your child and make it more easily palatable. The other thing is that the preparations like uh, sulfate, which has a higher elemental iron of 30%, is having uh, more gastritis. So you could do something like switching to a gluconate preparation, which will have lesser side effects. Again, if you take with meals, chances of suboptimal absorption are there. And it is always better to deworm the child before you start on iron. You would follow up your child in the OPD. And where in, uh, the patient has a moderate anemia or not very sick, mild anemia, you can do a repeat CBC after one month to assess response to therapy. But in cases of severe anemia, I would like to do uh, at least a clinical follow-up after one week and a CBC after two weeks. So depending on the severity of anemia, you can tailor your follow-up. Uh, Dr. Pooja, there's a query from Tarani uh, saying that many children complain of constipation after taking iron syrup. So how to approach them? Yeah, so Tarini, yes, it is very common that children do come with complaints of constipation. So in this case, you have to give iron. There is no substitute for that. But what we can do is we can sometimes just change the preparation. So if you're giving sulfate, you may switch to fumarate or gluconate. And sometimes that works. Another strategy, as I told you before, is taking it with meals. So sometimes those things can help. And of course, where nothing works, you may be compelled to, you know, sometimes even give uh, laxatives to your child. So these are the um, practical problems. And you can just try by changing preparations, which I find most rewarding. Uh, Pooja, how uh, you talked about deworming. So should uh, routinely deworming be done in all children with iron deficiency anemia? What is the current recommendation? The recommendation as per the government is also to deworm your kids every six months. So if the child has already been dewormed in the past six months, there is no rationale of giving it again. But where you find that there is no clear cut, uh, the mother doesn't know, the school is also probably not implementing. Right now, most schools are implementing uh, deworming children. However, if you can give it, so there is no harm. But if and you what do you think about those hemoglobin preparations that are available in the market? Uh... So that's what I told them that you know these enteric coated and tasseron these are very much in vogue, and a lot of practitioners give that. They are extremely costly, and I don't think they really are giving you any benefit over the current preparations. Just simple uh, maneuvers can do away with side effects rather than switching to costly medications. Like for prevention, we use weekly iron folic acid supplementation. So yes. can for treatment also the uh, intermittent regime can be used or we should stick to the daily regime only? Sure, sir. Intermittent is a very uh, popular method of uh, decreasing side effects. And there is scientific evidence to show that even bi-weekly or alternate day iron works equally well. Because we know there's a mucosal block theory and the duodenal mucosa where the iron gets absorbed, it gets saturated if you're giving iron every day. So they say those receptors are anywhere not available to you if you give iron every day. So you could give it every third day or every even twice a week and it works equally well. But since we do not have adequate evidence right now, they are not part of our recommendations. And at the same time, compliance is also an issue if you're taking a drug every day. So parents would remember, huh, rose dena hai. But if it has to be given day three or twice a week, then it is it, it, the compliance becomes definitely an issue. So uh, ideally, weekly iron folic acid supplementation or intermittent uh, should be supervised as far as that's why it has to be supervised and uh, not to be given. But it works okay. for compliance where your side effects are too many. So if, if you want to deal with your side effects, sometimes giving it on alternate day may actually make the patient compliant because he has lesser 
side effects. Uh, Ketki has a question on uh, National Iron Plus initiative. And uh, I think uh, she says give preventive doses. So should we follow it yes. ideally? Yes. I think it's it a government policy. One has yes. to follow it. You don't have to, an option. You have to follow it. Yeah. And any indication of parental iron therapy? That's a question. So we'll come to that in a scenario. I don't want to do that right now. Okay. So we'll be in another case soon. We'll be doing regarding parental. So let's move to the next case, I think. So is that okay? Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. You can keep noting your questions. And if uh, you have any question regarding to previous case, again, you can um, share at the end and we'll try to answer all these questions. So just to uh, let you know, because we have now today uh, Professor Pooja Diman with us, who is a professor of pediatrics at University College of Medical Sciences and uh, known hematologist. And uh, today she'll be taking case-based discussion related to common problem in pediatric hematology. We have just had finished one case and we are going on to the case too. So taking our background knowledge to this case, look at the CBC. I'm not reading it out for you. So this is a 15-month-old baby who has come with this CBC to you. Well, Sukrit has made a diagnosis, uh, <laughs> waiting for the rest. Uh, finding. Let's see the finding, not come to the or go to the diagnosis straight away. What do you think? MCHC with increased RBC. Okay. Any other, any other? Uh, so that's very correct. So you have a microcytic hypochromic picture. And the RBC count is raised. So you are getting the hang of it. Look at the RBC, look at the hemoglobin and then comment. So that will make your diagnosis definitely easier. So again, the rule of three, you saw that the hemoglobin should have been around 15. It was 9.4. And the RBC count, which is around 3.5 to 5.5. Here you see it is 5.6. So the RBC count is good. So they are synthesizing. So it's definitely not iron deficiency here. Because uh, your uh, bone marrow is synthesizing RBCs. But it's not always true. Let's see. The causes are coming and maybe it is a both IDA plus trait. Yes. So we have. Or another know. option, or Suma says maybe megaloblastic. So let's see what's in store for us going ahead. Okay. So yeah. megaloblastic, let me clarify, should not be made a diagnosis without a bone marrow. So that is a bone marrow picture. So what we had was only a CC in that your cells were mostly microcytic. So should not have been macrocytic. But yes, now look at the CBC, uh, the peripheral smear here. And again, I want you to comment on the cells that you see. So what is the red arrow? The red arrows are all, uh, you have already the identified targets. them. They're all target cells. I think and we... we also know what is the green arrow. The green arrow. Green arrows. Green arrow is this. Suggestion for green arrows. Greenish black. Okay, I can say this is black arrow. So black arrow is a pencil cell elliptocytes are okay. the suggestions. Okay. So you this is an elliptocyte, the yellow arrow. This is a teardrop cell, which is the blue arrow. This is a microcyte, which is your um, black arrow. So moving ahead. So I think you all have noted down. You are very correct. Target cells, you already identified. Okay. So, so what is the diagnosis? Menzer index. So the, men, the Menzer index is a ratio of your MCD by RBC count. So if the RBC counts are higher, the Menzer index will be lower. So 13 is taken at the cutoff. So if your Menzer index is less than 13, your patient would be suspected to be having thalassemia trait. However, I will say that my patient is having iron deficiency with thalassemia trait. Now, can anybody say why? What's the question? Why? What? Why do we have? Why am I saying that this is a combined condition and not simply a thalassemia trait, even though your Menzer index is eleven point five? Yes. So Praveen has said that there is an increased RDW and we also noticed on the peripheral smear that there was a lot of an isopoikilocytosis. So I should be suspecting iron deficiency alongside a thalassemia trait. So 
So these are the pointers on the basis of which you can distinguish the two conditions. And RDC count is a very important parameter. Again, RDW is very important, Menzer index, and definitely your peripheral smear. Because a thalassemia trait alone would not have so many anisocytosis, as we have seen in our peripheral blood. So he has both iron deficiency as well as thalassemia trait. So what do you do? You start him on iron or do you go for an HPLC? Which comes first? Iron or HPLC? HPLC, HPLC is the uniform HPLC, one. Huh? And some okay. are also writing iron. I would go with iron first. The reason being that because of uh, iron deficiency, it is also likely that your uh, hemoglobin A2, which is used for diagnosis of thalassemia trait, would be lower. So first you will treat the iron deficiency and after that you can do HPLC. Iron studies may or may not be done. It is not necessary to do them. If you find the child responding to your iron, you can simply do an HPLC after three months. And why do we need to know the HPLC status? Is it important? So HPLC status is important because you need to know the pro when he gets married, it's a long drawn thing. So it has a prognostic value for the next, for the pregnancy, whenever and later it happens, not immediately now, but it's good to know your status. Plus, uh, uh, thalassemia traits are known to be having mild anemia most of the time. So you may, even after giving iron, you may not be able to accomplish a very good hemoglobin status. So you shouldn't be worried in those cases. And if your hemoglobin is hovering around 10.5, 11, it's okay. Don't worry and don't go for further testing. So iron studies can give supportive evidence, of course, but it is not always necessary. In this child, it was done and the serum ferritin was found to be low. The cutoff, as I told you, was 12 for under 5 children. And HPLC done showed an HbA2 of 5.1. Anything which is more than 3.5 should suggest thalassemia trait. And I think Arnab had said that if you give uh, in uh, do HPLC in an iron deficient condition, there is chances of falsely low HPA2 values. And you're likely to miss the diagnosis of a trait. So this is how uh, you would get a Kunta report. And this is what would be your uh, graph on an HPLC. And you can see that the HBA2 is, is 5.9 in this patient. An alternative test which can be done, will, which will only tell you if there's a prominent band in the HbA2, it will not qual quantify the same as hemoglobin electrophoresis. So um, that will only just, sometimes you don't have HPLC in your hospitals and your pathology labs may be doing your hemoglobin electrophoresis. So a prominent HbA2 band would indicate that the patient is having a trait. A point to be remembered is that hemoglobin E, hemoglobin C, and hemoglobin O, these all share the same motility as A2. So sometimes it may be a HBE trait or it may be a um, E beta thalassemia. And again, you would be getting a very prominent band in HBA2. And if you quantify and you find that the value is more than 10%, then you don't say that this is HBA2. Then it is most likely either hemoglobin E hemoglobin C or hemoglobin O. So this is important when you decide whether your patient is having a E beta thalassemia or not. And in India, we all know that Northeastern states have a very high incidence of E beta thalassemia. Uh, are the slides visible? There was a comment in the chat box, slides are not visible. I can see the slides very clearly. Uh, I think Dela, it's your uh, problem at your end. So they are visible to the others. Okay. So it must be an isolated issue. Please go ahead, Dr. Pooja. So we wind up these two cases. These are, uh, I would just like to apprise you of um, what is available to us these days is automated cooter. But it is important not to forget your new boss chamber or your hemocytometer because a lot of things that are coming on your cooter reports can be fallacious. So uh, cooter is based on the principle of impedance and therefore, sometimes, you know, if in conditions where you have too many fragmented RBCs or clumping, then you can have false values and these need to be remembered. So just uh, telling you about the various advantages of Coulter, as you can see, there are so many new parameters that we are getting here. So as I told you, there is a reticulocyte 
hemoglobin content, which is a marker of iron, which can be used as a marker of iron deficiency. Then you can have an immature granulocyte fraction, which is important in neutropenic patients. You can have a platelet distribution width, which is important when dealing with thrombocytopenia, a mean platelet volume, which would again indicate whether the platelets are large or small. So these all parameters are something if you look at carefully, you'll get a lot of information. But at the same time, some fallacies are there, which I like to apprise you of. So reticulocyte hemoglobin content indicates iron deficiency. It is a very good marker of response to therapy. So once you give iron to your patient, the reticulocytes start proliferating. So if you notice a rise in reticulocyte hemoglobin content on day three, if you have a coulter and you can do that, it would be a very good marker of response to therapy. Percent hypochromic cells with more than 5% also indicate functional iron deficiency. However, the fallacies which you need to remember, as I told you, that if you have to fragmented RBCs, then it would lead to a very, very high RBC count. If you have very large platelets, they are likely to be counted as RBCs. If you have thrombocytosis, then again, sometimes they are counted as RBCs. Clumping leads to falsely low RBC counts. Again, if you are taking the sample and you're shaking it vigorously, RBCs get lies. And then again, the actual uh, measurement may be lesser. And if you look at the peripheral smear, you may be actually be able to count the red cells appropriately. So always a Coulter report should be accompanied with a peripheral smear. Again, falsely high MCD can be seen in conditions of red cell agglutination hyperglycemia where the cells are going to swell up because of osmotic uh, effect. You could have uh, falsely low MCVs in case of uh, hypochromic RBCs and even high temperatures which can lead to lysis of RBCs and they would be smaller, they would shrink. Again, hyperlipidemia can lead to a falsely high MCH. This is a very, very uh, common um, problem. If you notice very high MCH, you should always see whether the serum was lipemic. Most of the times when you're collecting the blood sample, you can see a lipemic serum would appear whitish to you. Again, certain malignancies associated with paraproteinemias also lead to high MCH. Hyperbilirubinemia, which also causes interference with the reading of your impedance, will lead to high MCH. Low MCH can mean fragmentation, giant platelets, and thrombocytosis. So the key message of these two cases would be a good peripheral smear is a must. Iron studies are rarely needed for diagnosis, but only to distinguish difficult conditions or where you are finding a suboptimal response. Uh, iron deficiency is associated with a low RBC count and a high RDW. In contrast, a trait would be associated with higher RBC count and a normal RDW. We should not forget that in our setting, both of these can coexist. And you must check for beta thalassemia trait only after you have given iron supplementation. HbA2 more than 3.5% should be regarded as suggestive of beta thalassemia trait.